Hello and welcome back to an episode of Generation Films. My name is American Ben. Just some quick housekeeping first. I know that a lot of you have probably just found this channel due to my video on the Tiger King and why I thought it was bullshit. And now you're seeing a sci-fi video and so you think this channel is kind of random. Sometimes we are, but usually we do do sci-fi stuff. So, um, I wish I could just do whatever on this channel whenever I wanted, but unfortunately that's not how YouTube works as far as getting people to see your content goes. So uh, if you are interested in seeing me do more ranting kind of stuff, then um, on my personal channel, American Ben, maybe I'll link it down below. Um, I think I'm gonna start posting videos like that. If you don't want that, just stay here, stick with this channel. You are not forced to go over there, but if you are, I'll be doing that over there. Anyways, that's it. On to this video. Well, the spread of the T-virus continues and people are eating each other in the streets, but they tell us we're all gonna be just fine. Yeah, I know we're doing the quarantine thing and coming up with all sorts of proposals for how to prevent people from dying and save the economy at the same time. But my bags are packed, people, because let's face it, Earth is done, canceled. Okay, not really. But we have to at least consider the possibility that one day a virus much stronger than Johnny Corona hits the Earth and infects humanity and necessitates a mass evacuation from our homeland. So listen, you've heard a billion different plans for overcoming this disease, but I would rather think about how we might get as many people off this planet as possible. So ladies and ladies, I present to you the top 10 ships for evacuating humanity from Earth. Now keep in mind that we're not just looking at giant carrier ships here, though those are often good options. We want the ships that are all around the most efficient for housing humans for long periods in space. At the same time, we also aren't just looking for the most powerful ships. Having sufficient weapons and tech to defend against aliens is definitely an important piece here, but it's not the only piece. And of course, we're going to only include human ships on this list because, well, most of us lack psionic powers, and so there's a lot of alien ships out there that are of no use to humanity. Most of the ships on this list will have just an asset or two or three that make them apt for service during an evacuation of Earth. But a few, especially the number one ship on this list, are all around really great options for housing humanity for long periods in space. The first ship on our list is the Valley Forge from Silent Running. The 1972 post-apocalyptic film Silent Running is set in a future time when plant life on Earth is becoming extinct. So, scientists and engineers have constructed giant greenhouse domes to preserve as many different plant specimens as possible and attached these domes to large spaceships, one of which is the Valley Forge, a converted American Airlines space freighter. In some respects, this ship would be highly problematic for housing humans in space. It's not really capable of defending itself against the Xeno, it lacks FTL capabilities, and without going on and on here, it doesn't have much of the advanced tech that other ships on this list do. But this ship belongs on this list because its engineers had the right idea. If we had to evacuate humanity from Earth tomorrow, we'd probably be less worried about running into the Xeno, and a lot more worried about providing the ship's inhabitants with food, water, and other resources. The giant greenhouses on the Valley Forge would provide a constant food source for human passengers. The green environments would also help to provide comfort to people and prevent mass cabin fever from breaking out. That said, this ship would probably work best in a scenario where Earth might one day become inhabitable again. Okay, for the next ship on this list, let's get real. I'm talking about the Rosinante from The Expanse, a Corvette-class light frigate. The Rosinante is a smaller ship, so it might not be the best option for a mass evacuation unless we build many of them. But it has one very important feature. Its engineers designed it to mimic g-forces similar to that of Earth. If you watched our video on what happens to humans in low-gravity environments, you know that this kind of technology is essential for long-term human survival in space. The Rosinante is an all-around very comfortable ship for humans to inhabit, and it can defend itself more than sufficiently. Next up we have the Death Star, though it's more of a space station. I don't really like the Death Star and I had wanted to go with a Star Destroyer like the Executor class or Eclipse class Dreadnought, but as far as I can tell those ships are just not that well suited for housing civilians, whereas the Death Star most certainly is. First off, the Death Star, well both Death Stars, were enormous. The first was over 74 miles in diameter, and the second was over 99. Thus, millions of people can be housed on a single Death Star. Yeah, it's true that much of its interior was devoted to its massive superlaser and the systems that operated it. 
but it did maintain many amenities for the civilians living on board. It had parks, shopping centers, recreation centers, taverns, and so on. So you combine its civilian-friendly facilities with its offensive and defensive weapon systems, and you have a pretty ideal deep space living situation for Earth's humans. The Death Star was also mobile, and thanks to its hyperdrive field generators, it could travel across space at faster than light speeds, so it was basically a massive starship. So why don't I like the Death Star? Well, it's hard to propose housing millions of humans inside giant sphere structures that while in theory are imposing war machines, in practice have been shown to be rather easily destroyed. Age old lesson, never leave your orbs exposed or you're going to get hit below the asteroid belt. Next up, we have the Mercury-class Battlestar from Battlestar Galactica, which came into use sometime after the first Cylon War. I don't have a lot to say about this ship, but what I like about it is that despite being almost 6,000 feet long, it only needs a crew of about 2,000 people to operate. The computer systems on the ship are such that any person can operate the ship from any other part of the ship, so the ship can operate with a smaller number of experienced crew members. A lot of the ships on this list might be bigger, but they require tens of thousands of crew to operate. The Mercury class, with its less burdensome crew requirement, could house more civilians per ship, which is ideal in a situation where you're evacuating humans from Earth, who, presumably in large majority, don't know anything about operating ships. Next up, we have Elysium from the film of the same name. Elysium takes place in the year 2154, when Earth's citizens are impoverished and lack adequate medical care. Meanwhile, rich and powerful humans live on Elysium, a massive space station in Earth's orbit. What I like about Elysium is that it masters allowing humans to live in luxury in space. Its medical care is also top-notch, as its med bays can cure all diseases, reverse the aging process, and regenerate body parts. When in space, humans will still need access to medical care, or illness and death could run rampant. Of course, Elysium isn't nearly as well defended as some of the other ships on this list, and it doesn't make me feel entirely comfortable that its computer core can be hacked to change who is allowed into the station. If Xenos are able to trick the system, they could invade and kill everyone. Next up, we have the Phalanx from 40K, a massive mobile space fortress monastery belonging to the Imperial Fist's Space Marine chapter. If we're going for size, this is our baby. The Phalanx is the size of a small moon, and is the closest that humanity has ever come to building something as epic in scale as the Eldar's craft worlds. This means that we would only need perhaps a couple to house the entirety of humanity if need be. You'd probably need a whole fleet of smaller ships to transport humans to the Phalanx in space, but given how big the thing is, this wouldn't really be an issue. The Phalanx can house as many transport ships as necessary. Additionally, the Phalanx is well constructed to guard from invasion. Encroaching aliens would have to slowly traverse the tight, winding corridors that make up the engineering and maintenance areas right inside the whole shell in order to get to the centers of population. This outer area is also separated from the fortress's inhabitants by hundreds of automated bulkhead doors that with the press of a button can be vented. Sucking the aliens out into the vacuum of space, killing them. Hmm. The Phalanx also contains a giant librarium for storing the accumulated knowledge of history. Humans could of course use this area to archive and preserve their most important memes. Next up we have the Terran Battlecruiser from StarCraft, a Terran capital ship. Battlecruisers were constructed to operate as self-contained cities. The thousands of passengers aboard had access to a variety of civilian-friendly facilities. The Gorgon-class battlecruiser specifically was well outfitted for housing civilians in space, as its interior contained an array of cantinas and rec rooms. Some classes of battlecruisers, such as the Behemoth, could operate within atmospheres and land on planetary surfaces, meaning that the ship could take humans straight from Earth and could search for new planets for humans to inhabit without having to disperse smaller groups into transport ships for landings. Battle cruisers also contain jump pods that in the case of emergency would allow passengers to abandon the ship and subsist in space for extended periods of time. Next up, we have the USCSS Prometheus from the Aliens franchise. Now, at only 427 feet long, this ship obviously wouldn't be able to evacuate humanity in large numbers. Instead, the strategy here would be to build a whole fleet of these ships and assign small groups of humans to each, though perhaps we could use this ship in conjunction with the Phalanx. The reason I like this ship is because it had all the features necessary for deep space exploration. Given its size, the ship's incredible amount of thrust power means that the ship can store more cargo than it could reasonably fit inside of it, meaning that its 20 or so passengers can bring all of their possessions with them. The ship also contains a hypersleep chamber, which can be programmed to initiate, maintain, and terminate hypersleep stasis. This means that the ship's crew members can simply sleep through long space voyages. 
The Prometheus also contains a Class D crew escape module, which can be used in the case of emergency. The module is almost a habitable ship in itself, as it contains seven luxury rooms, has a navigation system, and can be independently piloted. The Prometheus also has Class A individual crew ejection pods in case the crew escape module isn't an option. Finally, the ship has a med pod capable of performing medical procedures such as diagnosing, wound repair, C-sections, and other surgical procedures. Next up, we have to include the UNSC Infinity. Given this ship's mix of size, power, and civilian facilities, this is one of humanity's best options in the event of an evacuation. At over 18,000 feet long, 2,700 feet wide, and 3,400 feet high, the Infinity was the largest ship the UNSC ever built. The ship's 16 feet thick titanium A3 armored hull and energy shields could withstand a direct impact with a Covenant RCS class armored cruiser. Humanity would be very well protected aboard the Infinity, and the ship's advanced tech would allow humans to live in space rather safely. Best of all, the ship houses large recreational areas for its passengers to enjoy, such as a massive park with a self-contained biosphere replete with plant and animal life. The ship also features activity centers, bars, and multiple war games training areas, including a gigantic military simulation and test environment. In other words, the ship has state-of-the-art virtual reality video games to help its inhabitants pass time. I'm not saying you should want to leave Earth, but if you absolutely had to, the Infinity wouldn't be a terrible place to spend your time. Finally, the number one ship on this list, and in my opinion, it is far and away the winner, is the Galaxy Class from Star Trek, the most famous ship of which was the Enterprise D. First constructed in the mid-2360s, the entire ship was designed with civilians in mind, as family members of the crew were welcome on board. At an efficient 2,103 feet long, the ship was able to house 15,000 people at capacity, though 1 to 6,000 people on board was more the typical complement. And despite its family-friendly makeup, the Galaxy class sacrificed little in terms of advanced tech or offensive and defensive systems. It was one of the most sophisticated products of human engineering to come out of Starfleet, and throughout the Enterprise D's history, it successfully defeated many of the Federation's most fearsome enemies. That said, it truly was a ship built to accommodate civilians. For emergency situations, the ship's engineers designed the hull as two separate sections, a saucer-shaped primary hull and a detachable secondary hull. Both parts of the hull could be piloted and engaged in combat independently. In practice, in emergencies such as attacks, civilians would evacuate to the saucer module and fly to safety, and senior staff would retreat to the secondary hull, which contained the majority of the ship's weapon systems and engage the enemy. This feature always worked like a charm, of course. Anyway, you can see how this ship was designed with keeping the civilians on board safe in mind. Furthermore, the ship could house an entire working society inside of it. It had a wide array of medical facilities, from sick base to rehab centers, it had nurseries, schools, and a morgue. Though I probably should have listed the morgue after the medical facilities as to not imply that the kids on board were dying. Anyway, as far as emotional health goes, there was a counselor on board to attend to people's psychological needs, and for managing stress, an on-ship arboretum could provide an escape into nature. Though for female crew, a visit to Riker's quarters might do the trick as well, in half the time. There was also a ton of entertainment on board the ship, such as holodecks for some good old VR gaming, phaser shooting ranges, a movie theater, and rec rooms. A gymnasium, sporting equipment, a spa, a salon, and replicators for unlimited production of food and beverages, this ship just had it all. Anyway, you get the picture. Humanity would do well to produce about 500,000 of these babies, or just one or two giant phalanxes. You let me know what you prefer in the comments down below, and that is the video. Hope you enjoyed it. Please do give it a thumbs up if you did. And as I just said in the comments, let me know what you think the best ship or space station or strategy is for evacuating humanity from Earth. Remember to subscribe to our channel and hit that notification bell. For now, my name is American Ben. I'll catch you next time. Generation Films, peace.